This is Professor Ariel Ortiz Lagardere, broadcasting from the International Bariatric Club Studios in San Diego, California. The theme of today's IBC Oxford University Hot Topics in Surgery exclusive event is Marginal Ulceration After Laparoscopic Ruin Y Gastric Bypass and Mini Gastric Bypass, Medical, Endoscopic, and Surgical Management and Surveillance Strategies. And we'll feature experts from Mexico, Russia, Italy, Israel, India, Brazil, Australia, Germany, the United States, the United Kingdom, and the United Arab Emirates. We would like to thank our partners, Zoom Video Communications, YouTube, Facebook, Bariatric News, and Cinemed for setting up, promoting, and accrediting this webinar, which is sponsored by our platinum sponsors, Conmed, Medtronic, Ethicon Endosurgery, CMR Surgical, Lexington Medical, Panther Healthcare, our gold sponsors, W.L. Gore, Reach Surgical, Carl Stortz, Bariatric Solutions, Baxter, Advanced Medical Solutions, Liquid Band Fix 8, Feng Medical. Our silver sponsors, Mass Bariatric Technologies, Richard Wolf. This 30th IBC Oxford University webinar is streaming to millions of viewers from over 200 countries and territories through the IBC website, ibcclub.org, the IBC YouTube channel, via Facebook Live to the IBC Facebook page, the IBC Twitter feed, LinkedIn, and via IBC Instagram. This event is organized by Mr. Harris Kwaja, consultant bariatric surgeon and director of IBC Global Education, based at Chelsea and Westminster Hospital Imperial College London and Christchurch Oxford University. This event will be chaired by Professor Rafael Alvarez Cordero from Mexico and will be moderated by Dr. Alexander Neymark from Russia and Professor Mario Musella from Italy. My co-chair today is Professor Rafael Alvarez Cordero, who is founder and honorary president of the Mexican College of Surgery for Obesity and Metabolic Diseases since 1992. He is also co-founder of the International Federation for the Surgery of Obesity and Related Disorders, if so since 1995 and host and president of the second IFSO Congress in Cancun, Mexico in 1997. He is also IFSO president for the period of 2007-2008. He is member of the IFSO Board of Trustees since 2007. It is my distinct honor to present our honorary president, my personal mentor and friend, Don Rafael Álvarez Cordero. Bienvenido, Don Rafa. I also want to present uh, uh, our two moderators, Dr. Alexander Neymark from Russia. He is president of the Russian Society of Bariatric Surgery, Associate Professor Almosov National Medical Research Center, St. Petersburg, Russia. Welcome. And Professor Mario Musella from Italy. He is professor of surgery at the Federico II uh, University Advanced Biomedical Sciences Departments in Naples, Italy. And he's also the past president of the International MGBOAGB Club. Also, if so, delegate member in the executive board of the Italian Society of Bariatric and Metabolic Surgery, CICOB. Welcome to both our moderators, and I'm going to pass it on to Professor Alvarez Cordero to introduce our first speaker. Yes. I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Anna Carolina Hoff, uh, that will give a 15 minutes uh, lecture on latest medical treatment uh, for gastrojejunal and osmosis marginal ulcer. I have to say that Anna Carolina is founder, bariatric surgeon and bariatric endoscopy and angioscopy Sao Paulo and angioscopy Vail, Brazil. A specialist in combined therapies involving minimal inv invasive endoscopy techniques and medication for weight loss and weight maintenance. Professor? It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. Would you mind proceed? Yes. Can I share my screen? Yes. <clears throat> Can you see that? No. No? Are you able to see that? No, you have to share screen and then select the talk. Oh, it is. Desktop that you find. It Your is. talk has to be open. Share. My talk has to be open. For me, it's shared. It looks like it's shared. 
go ahead and yeah. unshare unshare it again. There you go. Yes. I really don't know what happens. So I don't want to sound like a broken record, but it's an honor to be here with an A-team. Asked to talk about latest medications, treatments for gastrojejunal anastomosis marginal ulcers, a click went inside my brain because as far as I knew, nothing new was actually going on except for problem pump inhibitors, association or not with cytoprotectors such as sucrophate and most time of treatment. Don't think about PPIs being the major star here. Uh, once I move forward, you'll be able to see there's much more to the subject. Symptomatic cases will always return to your practice or you have a protocol and perform an upper endoscopy at a regular basis or you just bump into an anew. Some delegate medical treatment to our clinicians and only get a call when something is not going right or something is going, uh, maybe an acute situation or a difficult case. The asymptomatic ones may present those complications that Dr. Abudaya is going to mention later on, like strictures, bleeding, fistulae, and when endoscopic therapy has its indications. Later on, we'll discuss surgical options too. It's a rising problem. It's underestimated for not every patient at the right moment undergo an endoscopy. But let's define MU. A marginal ulcer refers to the mucosa erosion at the gastrointestinal anastomosis, typically on the jejunal side. Having said that, whenever we mention MU today, we are talking about both Ryanu gastric bypass or about the mini gastric bypass or OIGB, one anastomosis or gastric bypass. Oh, back in the 1920s, this is already a matter of concern. On the top right corner, we'll be able to take a glimpse at another paper dated 1920, discussing our ulcers, images of our ghost, and a paper showing back in 1951, our colleagues were thinking about performing vagotomies in order to prevent the occurrence of MUs. So, Tricky once is a great deal of things that we know and remain unpublished. I read dozens of papers mentioning different, different PPIs associated or not with sucrophate, but most of all discussed with my colleagues and drew my conclusions. I'll focus many times on Dr. Abulayas papers for it's a very thorough paper regarding risk factors, treatments and outcomes. Along the presentation, some other papers may disagree with some of this data at any level, but the structure is very thick and the starting point for everyone interested in fully understand M use. So let's name NSAIDs as part of a problem as they are used by many patients at a regular basis and extensive link to the formation of peptic ulcers. Smoking is a confirmed risk factor, and Dr. Almino emphasizes that if the patient is not willing to quit smoking, he might be a good candidate for a sleeve, not for a bypass. Alcohol consumption, the presence of diabetes that leads to ischemia and heart diseases that runs with low perfusion to organs. But most importantly of this slide is the length of the pouch. If you have a longer pouch as seen in a mini gastric bypass, will MU increase in a comparison to my gastric bypass? That's something you guys need to answer to me. If you have a longer pouch, you have more parietal cells and therefore an increased acid production. Let's not forget literature mentions MU incidents between 0.6 to 16% within gastric bypass operations. So length of pouch was seen for many years as the culprit of MU. I pinpoint an important paper on the right written by Dr. Mainson, uh, linking smaller pouches to fewer incidents of MU, an effort to minimize acid production from parietal cells. 
This is well, very well discussed in Dr. Abudayas' papers. He highlights five major facts that concurs to the fact that higher acid chambers are direct, directly related to amuse. This paper dated 1977 also shows the graph where you see acid secretion versus ours. The smaller the gastric chamber, the lower the gastric production. Still, we have to remind that we can know acidity levels and immune are side by side when we study the positive effects of PPIs for managing most part of uncomplicated ulcers. So let's move on. Most immune occurs on the gastrojejunal anastomosis and on the jejunal itself, but the new data here regards the number of cases per year after surgery. Most ulcers occur on the first two years after procedures. So it's something to keep in mind when defining a screening protocol for our patients. Another thing I always have to mention, I also have to mention diet patterns. I didn't read it anywhere, anywhere, but it's something that I have discussed with Dr. Gabriel Caro Nunes. High ingestion of acid beverage and foods are, in his point of view, a detail that cannot be forgotten. I have to remind the surgeon, him or herself, because being an endoscopist too, at a very high volume center, I am able to look not only at my team's work, but at my peers. And that this is something really awkward. Mucosal ischemia is something well mentioned and is also related to techniques and surgeons. Sometimes the pouch is poorly ir irrigated. If the bowel suffers over traction when lifted, you have to an issue and PPIs won't do the task. Absorbable sutures versus permanent sutures, especially regarding the inner layer, even talking absorbable sutures, proline versus ethibond. We see a higher percentage of strictures when using ethibond. PDS could be the ideal suture for its lasting but absorbable. Still, let's not forget about Helicobacter pylori. The majority of papers consulted highlights the importance of its eradication prior to the procedure or using MI or doing MI treatment. Moving on to a medical treatment itself, it's a very interesting paper, a meta-analysis. Even though there is a great amount of studies, studies reviewed, the conclusion is the findings suggest a significant benefits of PPIs prophylactic in reducing amuse after gastric bypass surgery, nothing more. A paper from Brigham dated 19, 20, 2017 alerts physicians to break the capsules to increase bioavailability of those drugs. It's another perspective rather than just dosage or length of treatment. Regarding symptoms, we have pain leading Dr. Abudayas tables, as well as bleeding, anemia, nausea, and vomiting, and let's not forget dysphagia. Analyzing both meta-analysis from Dr. Ying and the paper from Dr. Abudaye, I'd like to highlight some facts. Healing rate in the PPI group was 68% versus 67% in the PPI plus sucrophate group. However, Two further ulcers healed when they added sucrophate after failure to heal on PPI alone. Great hint for us. As far as medications per se goes, papers show different drugs and forms of administrations. Some use omeprazole for a, a month. Others don't mention with which PPI recommend, but recommended for three months. Garrido here in Brazil uses esomeprazole for two months. Van Dessel uses omeprazole for three months. And Eva Wilson described H2 blockers for only a month. Many surgeons simply don't prescribe medications at all. Still, Dr. Ying questions the optimal durations of PPI prophylaxis on her meta-analysis. Another study by Dr. Kang back in 2016 bring light to us. A comparison of 30 day versus 90 day PPI therapy opens an important door. Let's see, it's very important table. This is the paper, and this is the most important table. 
is showing the MIMU rate, 12% versus 6% when comparing 30 to 90 day treatment. Dr. Koblin in 2013 mentions that medical treatments of MU consist on PPIs, H2 antagonists, sucrophate, or a combination of those medications. And after reading every one of his references, I can add up the phrase, up to two years. His work is also very important explaining the role of H. pylori eradication for the success of MU treatments. No difference in eucerogenic potential was found between open or laparoscopic procedure, but there's a but. Dr. Capella showed that the use of staples results in a higher incidence of M use. Hasmussen shows that 32% of ulcer beds showed remnants of suture material, and that's something I like to share with you from my personal and Dr. Andre Carlos experience. Here we have another three major papers on uh, three different approaches that help us draw conclusions. De Hon showing MU numbers begin to escalate on the third month after surgery, you can see in purple. Dr. Bethany Sachs concludes that the use of non-observable sutures in the inner layer is associated with an increased MU number and mentioning a letter to the editor of Obesity Surgery dated September 2020 from Dr. Mahawa, quote, I, I recommend PPI prophylaxis to my gastric bypass patients with lansoprazole 30 milligram daily for five years. I therefore wholeheartedly support the increase of PPIs to from six to 12 months. In fact, I might suggest they go further beyond for incremental benefits. But let's think outside the box, and I love doing that. I have chronic insomnia, and those sleepless nights are a true blessing for my strokes of serendipity, of course, during those lonely hours. Let's think vonoprazam. I will present you three papers regarding this drug that is changing dramatically in the course of GERD, peptic, and ESD ulcers. Bonoprazam is a PCAB drug, a potassium competitive acid blocker, 350 times superior to PPIs, providing healer uh, time. And we are aware of PPIs limitations, despite those listed on this table and the controversial ones like dementia and the paper in COVID. And literature is showing us that the longer the prophylaxis with PPIs, the better the results regarding immune treatment. So crossroads. Vonoprazent exerts a direct and targeted effect on parietal cells, providing a rapid potent and long-lasting inhibitor of acid secretion, including a better nighttime control. It may sound like propaganda, but this is the expert opinion on pharmacology, an Italian study. I'm currently, along with Dr. Rihanna Bardurgin from John Hopkins, Dr. Liz Bezerra, Dr. Manuel Galvão, Dr. Almino Ramos here in Brazil, developing a protocol and dividing patients to begin a randomized double-blind study with our MU patients. Let's wait for results. The future of MU relies, may, may, treatments may rely on PCABs, may, because we have to conclude there are possible new tools. I'm willing to prove a new hypothesis regarding vronoprazam in MUs if excess acidity is an issue for that particular patient. But we have to expand our minds. It's not only drugs. Our patients need to quit smoking, quit alcohol, needs to stop NSAIDs, consult a dietitian, proceed to H. pylori treatment, control their diabetes and cardiovascular disease. And we surgeons need to rethink our suturing material and maintain team training. Every day is a day to learn and improve. I'd like to thank my dear colleagues, Dr. Almino Ramos, Dr. Caetano Marquezini, Dr. André Carlos, Dr. Gabriel Caro Nunes, Dr. Manuel Galvão, and Dr. Liz Bezerra, two of them here today for the upcoming discussions. Together, we are stronger. Thank you, guys.
I'm going to pass it on to Dr. Alexander Neymark and Professor Mario Musella so they can ask some interesting questions to our presenter. Okay. Thank you, Anna, for this interesting presentation. Um, uh, I want to ask you one uh, question about it. Uh, what do you think about prescribing of PPI for one for the period more than one year. What do you think about it? I saw your smile when, uh, on the moment when it was five years for PPI, but it's interesting what you think, because uh, in, in articles uh, we see that it's uh, really, uh, ulceration is goes down after PPI, long, long PPI. I think you're 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 right when uh, you think I, I think you think five years is too much. I think five years is way too much. I'd go with a three month treatment, although the the new recommendation is to to make an upgrade from six to twelve months. I think if acidity is a problem, maybe we should focus on three to two years because it's the the, the if you remember that table, it's the, the length of time that most MU occurs. I, I also am a, an endoscopist, so I, 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 I love to looking at my patients um, two months after the procedure or from four months after the procedure. And most, most ulcers are asymptomatic. And so I think there's no use of using for five years because if acidity is a problem, it, it will happen sooner. And uh, as 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 as, uh, as the same is going to happen if the ischemia is a problem, but Dr. Abudaya is going to to talk about that. I'd go with a uh, three months to up to a year, maybe two for access, but not longer than that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Professor Mario. Hey, okay, thank you. Thank you, Ariel, Harris, and Gloria for, for the invite, of course. Happy happy to be here with all those friends as usual. Well, uh, great talk, Anna. It's very interesting what you told us. But, um, my, my question is, you are an endoscopist, as, I, as you told us. And uh, what is your feeling? I, mean, I believe probably the, the one anastomosis gastric bypass is not so common in Brazil. Probably you use more the, the, the standard one white gastric bypass, but probably you have you had experience with, with both of them. So uh, do you, do you do, did you see uh, any differences in the ulcer rate uh, between uh, the two procedures? Uh, what is your experience about that? Because you were, you were telling us that probably uh, with the longer pouch we have in a one anastomosis gastric bypass, there's there's much much more parietal cells. But conversely, I believe that uh, the blood supply that can be one of the issues is better in the one anastomosis gastric bypass because the pouch is longer is 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 better vascularized than the Rembai gastric bypass. So happy to know your your position about that. Oh, well, uh, I've seen little cases of mini gastric bypasses here in Brazil, so I, I, I don't have the, the endoscopist feeling to tell you rather <laughs> there's, uh, if the numbers are, are the same, but I, 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 I can see your point of view and there's, of course, uh, you, you're absolutely right. So we have to, to maybe we should run some more studies on that because it's a conclusion we cannot draw at this time at this moment and in in my country so that's why i ask my my fellow colleagues to help me with that because maybe they they heard about another study that i i, I was like fearing from fomo fear of missing out something because there isn't much in literature if you compare the mini gastric bypass with the ruinai gastric bypass mm -hmm. There is nothing saying anything about the, the comparison of that, but uh, the literature has a lot to say about the length of the pouch. But if you analyze from your perspective, and I mean, it's right, uh, ischemia may be a major fact on RIGB rather than in mini gastric bypass. 
Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to pass it on back to Dr. Alexander so he can present our next speaker. Okay. Uh, thank you, Anna. And uh, let me uh, introduce the next speaker. It's Professor Bahram Abu Daye, uh, who, um, who is a professor of medicine, director of uh, uh, advanced uh, endoscopy and consultant. Uh, gastroenterologist Mayo Clinic Rochester, USA. It's chair of the IFSO Bertic Metabolic Endoscopy Committee and co chair of Bertic Committee American for Gut Society. Please, Professor. Thank you, colleagues. First of all, everybody sees the presentation and the audio is good. Yes. Yes. All right. So it's a distinct honor and pleasure to be with, with you today in another episode of the IPC. Uh, thank you for Ariel and for uh, Harris for this invitation. And it's always a pleasure because I learn more than I teach with these conferences and that's, that's a distinct pleasure. So today we're gonna to be talking about endoscopic management of marginal ulcers and complications. These are my disclosures for the talk. And before we start discussing how do we manage these endoscopically, it's, it's very important to level set where we are as far as technology that enable us to do some of these interventions. So now we have the advent of endoscopic ultrasound that allows us to do therapeutics within the vessels by injecting coils into uh, the bed of the ulcer for uh, a bleeding ulcer if needed or any, any other substances like cyanoacrylate. We have Lumen opposing stents that allows us to create endoscopic anastomosis to bypass an area of problematic structure or an ulcer in order to allow it to heal. We have closure devices that went beyond endoscopic clips to now involve over the scope clips, suturing devices that could suture with high fidelity in the GI tract, plication devices that could plicate large fistulas and now the newer kids of the block is this XTAC device that allow us to have a wide margin closure of any endoscopic defect. So technology has significantly improved over the past 10 years. We have a variety of tissue sealant and injectables that will allow us to work and, and deliver therapeutics for the treatment of marginal ulcerations uh, in the GI tract. So Dr. Hoff did a wonderful job talking about the medical aspect of the management Few disclosures before I discuss the endoscopic part. Some of these interventions require high technical skills in advanced endoscopy. So it's very important that these interventions are done in a setting of a multidisciplinary team where an, a, where an interventional gastroenterologist is partnering with, with a, their, uh, their su surgical colleague in order to deliver these interventions. And that's the way we approach it at Mayo Clinic the interventional team and the surgical team are one team and we always operate together to that end. So I'm not gonna belabor these points just to emphasize the point that Dr. Hav made that marginal ulcers are common in the first month after the procedure, then their incidence becomes less after one year. Uh, in a rural gastric bypass, most of the marginal ulcers happen at the level of the gastrojunal anastomosis 50% above the anastomosis and 40% in, in the jejunal side. The risk factors highlighted before very nicely by Dr. Hoff, but they include diabetes, NSAID use, and smoking. Management for medical uh, treatment includes smoking cessation, avoiding NSAIDs, open capsule PPI, and sucrophate. And healing with this medical management strategy uh, is, is quite good as, as shown by Dr. Hoffman. Now, when do you pursue endoscopic management for these, uh, uh, these ulcers? One is to remove a foreign body reaction. That means if the ulcer bed has multiple sutures and staples, you could use endoscopy to remove these sutures and staples to allow medical therapy to take its course. And that allows for further enhanced treatment to about 20 to 60% of these ulcers. It's also helpful when there's a concomitant gastric, gastric fistula. That means 
The problem with marginal ulceration is multifactorial, but one of it is that the acid is not buffered by the bicarbonate from the pancreas. So a gastrogastric fistula could be problematic and you need to address that in a setting of refractory marginal ulceration. And that could happen in up to 8% of cases. Obviously a perforation or a deep marginal ulcer in a poor surgical candidate could be a fair game for a therapeutic endoscopy. This happens at less than 1% of cases. Management of hemorrhage, both acute and later, uh, could be attempted uh, through advanced endoscopic tools and techniques. Non-healing uh, ulcers to oversew in order to cover the ulcer bed to allow the medical therapy to enhance healing. And finally, stenotic and recalcitrant uh, marginal ulcers. So I'm going to address a lot of these scenarios in case examples uh, to uh, allow you to get a flavor of what the field of therapeutic endoscopy could offer. First is hemorrhage take up uh, take home points. Uh, endoscopy should be performed in the OR with a surgical backup in, if there's any significant hemorrhage within the first week or so after the procedure. It's safe to do endoscopy, but CO2 insufflation is mandatory uh, in this setting. You avoid electrocautery on a fresh stable line and you maximize mechanical uh, interventions like endoscopic suturings or clips in these settings. This is an example. This is a massively bleeding uh, ulcer that uh, occurred uh, within seven days of a Aroa gastric bypass. And the management approach here, again, is to start with dual modality therapy. You inject uh, epinephrine in order to uh, create temporary hemostasis. Then you use endoscopic suturing to oversaw this ulcer uh, for the treatment of that uh, the, uh, of that ulcer. So you could see the overstitch is a device that places two oproline sutures. And this is the results after the oversaw of this ulcer uh, in about uh, a few weeks after. This is six weeks follow-up. This is went from a massive hemorrhage a week after bypass to a fully healed, nice ulcer and you could see here's the suture and now the bed of the ulcer is epithelializing and the anastomosis uh, is is looking healthy now marginal ulcer oversaw it's it's the concept that if you're failing uh, medical management with ppi sucrophate all the lifestyle interventions now you need a strategy to over to cover with healthy mucosa the bed of the ulcer to buffer it from irritants uh, that could uh, prevent it from healing. And that's the concept of marginal ulcer over. So it's very important to rule out with a CTA or endoscopic ultrasound a small pseudoaneurysm before you embark on suturing. And the key here is to approximate healthy surrounding tissue to cover the ulcer bed and continue aggressive concomitant medical therapy. This is another case, 39 year old female, abdominal pain, laparoscopic row gastric bypass 2019, marginal ulcer diagnosed in, two, in December of 2019, present with acute uh, onset of severe abdominal pain, uh, denies history of NSAIDs, CT scans showed small locules around the deep ulcer indicating an early perforated ulcer. And this is how we manage this ulcer because she had uh, poor substrate for a revision surgery. Here you could see uh, the uh, exudate on top of the ulcer. We start by defining the margins of the ulcers and cleaning the exudates. Uh, this is you're looking. This is on the uh, saddle side of the rulum. Uh, we we'll start with the over, uh, overstitch. Here is a diagram that I placed to allow, to orientate you on how we oversaw the ulcer. Again, we're trying to get normal mucosa to cover the ulcer bed, which is a sizable large ulcer here. So we start in this position with the blue dot, and then we continue to march on by cinching the suture. Then we go back to the red dot position, and then we go back to the red. And then finally, after a zigzag suture, this is the end result. You take a big ulcer and you oversaw it with a nice Inter, uh, uh, mucosa above it and to allow healing of this uh, ulcer. So how about concomitant gastrogastric fistula with these marginal ulcerations? Again, the incidence of uh, gastrogastric fistula is higher when uh, we had partitioning of the gastric bypass rather than divided gastric bypass. 
uh, where the incidence fell down to one to two percent. But these marginal, uh, these gastrogastric fistula could be problematic for a healing of a marginal ulcers. So in a study of about 1,200 patients, 15 developed a gastrogastric fistula, and the presentation was detailed as such. As you could see, eight of them had marginal ulceration. So for these patients, you need to address the gastrogastric fistula in order to uh, treat that marginal ulcer endoscopically. So uh, what's endoscopic options? I could tell you that unlike the field of oversaw of an ulcer where we have good results, closure of a gastrogastric fistula with current endoscopic techniques is not that good. Therefore, we've been trying to innovate along the theme, but the traditional tools that's been used for gastrogastric fistula is, uh, is the use of uh, fibrin glue uh, for smaller fistulas, the use of uh, cyanoacrylate to plug these small fistulas, uh, and endoscopic suturing, as you could see in this image, to close these fistulas. Uh, however, I could tell you, a fistula that's more than one centimeter in diameter have a very low chance of durable closure with endoscopic techniques. That's why we've been trying to push the field and determine what could we do endoscopically for larger fistulas that are not very responsive to endoscopic management. And for this, we present another case. It's a 49 year old male with a weight regain after OY gastric bypass, but also had a marginal ulcer that presents intermittently with melanin. Uh, when you uh, looked at his uh, anastomosis, you could see uh, shortly here that it's, uh, we could see that the, here's the triple lumens. This is the gastrogenostomy. This is the blind end right here. This is the rule limb right here. And you could see the fistula to the old stomach is bigger than the, the rule limb proper right there. So again, his representation is he heals with medical therapy, then the, the ulcer returns, he heals, then the ulcer returns and then bleed. So this is the excluded stomach. So the thought here uh, was to try to uh, kind of eliminate or create, create a high pressure zone within the excluded stomach in order to keep acid in it rather than introducing the acid back to the marginal ulcer zone. So what we did, we did a gastroplasty of the excluded stomach to close the excluded stomach. Uh, uh, and allow us to, to create this high pressure zone to allow the acid to move to the duodenum rather than going back to the gastrojejunal anastomosis. So this is the excluded stomach. This is the suturing pattern that we're gonna be uh, alluding to. We're starting with the red dot here, then going to the greater curvature, then we're going to the posterior, and we're suturing again with this uh, with a 2O proline suture using the overstitch uh, endoscopic device. And now we're in the process of creating this gastroplasty in the excluded stomach. And I'll show you the results shortly here. And now here, the done product. Here is now the blind end. Here's the rulum and the gastrogastric fistula is closed, but not as a primary layer. The entire excluded stomach is closed to prevent acid from reproxying to the anastomosis. So this is the before, and this is the after. This is the fistula before, and this is the fistula after, after closure of the entire excluded stomach with endoscopic suturing. So fourth case is the case of a, uh, of a resistant marginal ulcer. And this is a challenge. This is a patient who already had a revision for a perforated large marginal ulcer, continues to smoke, continues to have dietary indiscretion, and, and she presented frequently to the emergency room with, with symptoms of obstruction and bleeding. And you could see this is the rulum, and this is a two-thirds circumferential uh, gastrojejunal uh, marginal ulcer. This is the pediatric scope. So the lumen of the rulum is also compromised with this. So this is obviously required a multidisciplinary team to come together and decide on the best management option. Again, she already got a revision surgery and that continued to recur after revision surgery. So for her case, we opted to uh, revise the gastric bypass by creating a new anastomosis between the stomach and the excluded stomach and then closing the rulum proper uh, for a period of time to allow the ulcer to heal. So here we're using endoscopic ultrasound. We're introducing this lumen opposing stent in order to create a connection between the gastric pouch and the excluded stomach. Uh, this is uh, then we. This is now the new connection. You could see you enter the connection to the excluded stomach, 
This is again going through the rulem, showing the two thirds circumferential ulcer uh, that we were dealing with with this situation. And this is now advancing to the duodenum. Now we're using argon plasma to te temporarily close the rulem and allow food to egress through the neurocreated gastrogastric uh, anastomosis to divert uh, this food from that area. We closed this uh, rulem with suturing. And now we have reversed this gastric bypass to allow things to uh, uh, bypass this area of uh, frequently perforating marginal ulcer. So uh, here we could see this is the closed rulum. This is now the new egress of the stomach. And uh, the idea here is we're not planning to keep the rulum closed forever. We're gonna open it up at some point, but we're gonna allow the ulcer to heal before we open it, at, before we open it up. And uh, this is the results. This is six months follow-up. You could see the very big circumferential marginal ulcer now is a small trivial eight millimeter ulcer. This is the connection to the excluded stomach. So what we're gonna do now is to remove the stent, close the gastrogastric fistula and allow the patient to continue uh, with, with their therapy. And finally, in the last minute or so is uh, difficult recalcitrant bleeding. Again, this is a marginal ulcer that could not, uh, the bleeding could not be addressed with interventional radiology or endoscopy. Uh, and the patient was a very poor surgical candidate for any intervention. So we used endoscopic ultrasound to find the culprit vessels that's bleeding at the marginal ulcer. Here we use Doppler to identify that this is the vessel. This is the mucosal layer where the ulcer is starting. And now what we're using is we're using localized treatment to inject coil uh, in order to manage the bleeding of that ulcer and to allow healing. Uh, here we're injecting the coil. You could see this is echolinear endoscopic ultrasound using a 19 gauge needle, finding the, uh, the vessel. And here's the needle coming into the vessel. And now we're injecting, as you could see, the coil directly into the vessel. And now if you look at the ulcer, it's uh, a few weeks later, it has uh, nicely healed to a small trivial ulcer from a massively hemorrhaging ulcer before the coiling. So in summary, marginal ulcers can pose significant uh, management challenges to clinicians and surgeons taking care of these patients. A collaborative endoscopic surgical approach is important. Advancement in discopic tools and technology allows for a minimally invasive and anatomy preserving approach in selected cases, but this has to be as a team between uh, interventional GI and surgeons in order to take care of the patient. And with that, I conclude and thank you for your kind attention. Wonderful presentation, Barham. Pass it on to Alexander. Thank you. Thank you. Really interesting presentation about treatment. Uh, I have a few questions, but first of all, uh, one question. Uh, what do you think about um, type of anastomosis? Uh, the difference between uh, stapler anastomosis and hand tube anastomosis. Uh, did you see a difference uh, of, the, um, uh, of the ulcers, how it's often happens or? Uh, I thank you, Alexander, for that question. I don't think I could discern any difference. The key is uh, when, when you're dealing with early with an unhealing ulcer, and it's important to try to remove any extra sutures or staples, regardless of how the anastomosis is done. So that's the next step after medical treatment is we go and look to see if there's staples or sutures, and we could easily remove them to allow the, the medical therapy to take its course. Whether the hand sewn uh, or the stapled is different as far as marginal ulcer, I do not, I cannot answer that question with good confidence. Okay, thank you. Mario? So, great presentation, great talk, great images especially. So, well, just a comment more than a, than a question. Uh, I mean, by, by looking at your presentation, my thought go went to, uh, about the need that we, we have now of a, a, an endoscopist that it's maybe fully dedicated, entirely dedicated to bariatrics. Uh, a little bit like, as is happening in general surgery. In general surgery, I am dedicated to bariatrics, 
The, my friend at the next door is dedicated to colorectal. So I believe this is important to, to get good results. And, and a very quick question that is, do you have in your institution any uh, ongoing study comparing the results, for example, or, and the suturing that, that you've shown us with a, a perforated ulcer with a standard surgery? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Professor Mario. So I, I completely agree with you. This is not somebody who knows how to pass a scope could do these intervention. It would require a fully dedicated interventional fellowship in order to understand the tools and techniques. And I think with, with, with the increase in bariatric surgery and the collaboration between GI and surgery, it's very important to even have gastroenterologists, interventionists who are only dedicated to work with their surgical colleagues on these complications. I think for sure the field is heading that way. This is the model that we're using. My colleague Omar Ganam is right here. That's exactly what we do at Mayo. Is it's, it's, it's a communion patient and we all do what's right for the patient, whether it's surgery, endoscopy, or what, what, what have you. Uh, as far as comparative study, we do not have, we, could, we have retrospective uh, analysis of some of these uh, data, but we have not uh, had a prospective study. But since my colleague Omar just joined and he's gung-ho about these studies, probably we'll start one very soon. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, gentlemen. Just moving right on, we're gonna go and uh, pass on to the presentation of the chair of the video session. Uh, and uh, that will be Professor Rafael Alvarez Cordero who will be presenting and I will be presenting immediately after that the whole expert panel. Don Rafa. Now it's my pleasure to present Professor Annie Takla, who will chair the video session entitled Surgical Strategies to Manage Perforation of a Giant Marginal Ulcer After Laparoscopy Run Y Gastric Bypass. Professor Takla is General and Bariatric Surgery, Winchester Physical Society, Winchester, Massachusetts, USA. Attending surgery in the Winchester Hospital, Winchester, Massachusetts. Clinical instructor, Department of Surgery, Tufts University, University School of Medicine in Boston, and medical director of robotics, Winchester Hospital, Winchester, Boston, Massachusetts. Professor Takla, if you please. And immediately before uh, uh, Professor Takla in initiates, I just want to present our expert panel. I'm going to start off with Professor John Morton from the United States. He is Professor and Vice Chair of Division Chief Bariatric and Minimally Invasive Surgery, Yale School of Medicine, United States. He's also Chair of Committee for Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery of the American College of Surgeons and past president of the ASMBS, the American Society for metabolic and bariatric surgery in the period of 2014 and 2015. I want to welcome him and I want to welcome uh, Dr. Liz Rezerra, <coughs> bariatric surgeon, obesity and diabetes center, Hospital Santa Joana Recife, Brazil, master's degree from the Federal University of Pernambuco, Brazil, and a specialist in medical nutrition, coordinating the nutritional therapy team at Hospital Santa Joana Recife in Brazil. She's also faculty of, at IRC CAD in Rio de Janeiro bariatric endoscopy course. Uh, I also want to welcome Dr. Ken Loy from Australia, consultant bariatric, upper gastrointestinal hernia and oncology surgeon at St. George Public and Private Hospital, Karina Private Sutherland Public Hospital and Hertzville Private, director of St. George Hospital Obesity Surgery Center, and he's also the current treasurer of the IFSO Asia Pacific chapter. I also want to welcome Dr. Adriana Rotundo from the UAE. She is head of the Upper GI General Surgery and Bariatric Unit at Ceja Emirate Hospital in Abu Dhabi, UAE. Also consultant general, lap laparoscopic and bariatric surgeon at Med Clinic Parkview, Dubai, in, in the same UAE. Mr. M. Shafiq Javed from the UK. He is consultant bariatric surgeon from Phoenix Health in the United Kingdom and consultant upper GI cancer surgeon, Liverpool University Hospital, NHS Foundation Trust, Liverpool, United Kingdom. 
honorary lecturer as well of the University of Liverpool in the United Kingdom. And Dr. Ben Clapp from the United States General Minimally Invasive Surgery and Bariatric Attending Surgeon, Chief of Surgery at Providence Hospital El Paso, Texas in the United States. Also Associate Clinical Professor of Surgery, Texas Tech Paul F. Foster School of Medicine, and he's also the treasurer of the Texas Association for Bariatric Surgery in the period of 2020-2022, editorial board for surgery for obesity and related diseases, ANCMBS Research Committee 2019 to the present. And lastly, Professor André Kedar from Israel, chairman of Department of Surgery, Asuta Ashdod Public Hospital Ashdod Israel, professor of surgery and Ben-Gurion University, Israel. And I will now pass it on to Professor Takla so he can initiate the session. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. Um, everybody see my screen? Okay. Wonderful. Okay, great. So uh, thank you for the introduction and thanks to the IBC for these uh, great sessions. And it's a pleasure and a privilege to be here uh, among all of you. Uh, so my, my video today is about the surgical management of a perforated uh, giant marginal ulcer. Um, so I was asked uh, by Harris, to, and these are my disclosures, um, which are not relevant to this talk. Um, so I was asked by Harris to put a, you know, a video that's about four minutes uh, about this, you know, issue, this cha challenging problem. So I'm going to try to be brief. Um, I'm going to stop in the middle. I think the, you know, I have the panelists weigh in on uh, what to do with that uh, situation. So all of us get this call. Uh, we talked about the incidence of marginal ulcer about 16% and, um, you know, the perforation that we see. And these pictures are um, uh, courtesy of one of my friends, uh, Dr. Curtis Peary from South Dakota. You see these, um, you know, marginal ulcers, we all get this call, um, you know, patients come in with a, a acute epigastric pain and uh, sometimes features of sepsis and um, uh, it's easily diagnosed by CT scan. And uh, a lot of times we see them and uh, the treatment for that surgically is easy. But uh, this is one of my patients. Uh, and the question is what to do with, you know, a challenging problem like that. So um, I usually don't expect to see that uh, with these marginal ulcers, but sometimes we do. Uh, so this is a patient of mine that's uh, one year post um, a Roux-en-Y gastric bypass uh, that kind of lost for follow-up, um, which, you know, is a common theme. But you can see here, um, you know, there's almost complete disruption of the anastomosis. So this is the gastric pouch. You'll see the orogastric tube coming out of the gastric pouch here. Uh, and this is the rule limb. And it's kind of like really... Um, held up by this bridge of small bridge of tissue. Uh, there's a lot of pus, there's a lot of inflammatory rind posteriorly to be able to get behind the anastomosis and uh, the pouch and uh, the rule limb was very, very challenging. Um, you know, asking the patients afterwards, uh, you know, she returned to, um, she wasn't a smoker before surgery, but she um, uh, was afterwards when the drinking, she was actually transferred to me in another, uh, from another facility, uh, was kind of in the middle of the night um, with this, you know, large uh, subphrenic abscess on CT. And uh, she wasn't septic, but she was tachycardic. Um, so lots of things to think, things, think about, things to think about right here and, you know, what to do in this, you know, situation um, at 2 a.m. in the morning, have one person assisting, which is a scrub tech, no resident, no fellow, um, no first assist, and what would be the options? Uh, and I think I'm gonna stop here for a minute and ask the, you know, the rest of the panel, what would they do in sort of, a, you know, a complex situation like that? What are the thought pro? What is the thought process? What are the steps that we would go through uh, to deal with this? I don't know where we where we want to start. Um, if anybody has any thoughts, uh, comments. Well, this is uh, this is John Morton, Dr. Taklo. I I like the presentation because we all have to confront this at one point or another. And I think one the first thing is deciding if the patient needs to go to the OR. You know, seeing if their vital signs are stable, changes in creatinine. Um, once you make that decision to go to the OR, is making sure you're prepared and like you have here, oftentimes it's in the middle of the night. So making sure you got all your equipment, you know, before you get started. And one thing that I consider part and parcel of surgery is the, the scope, 
you know, I want to be able to, if I can't find uh, the ulcer for whatever reason, which does happen, um, is to have the scope to help elucidate where it is. Um, the other thing I'm thinking here is more damage control. Uh, you know, if this patient's at all unstable, it's, uh, it's not a good option to, for example, redo the anastomosis, which I have seen people do, and inevitably it fails. Uh, that is not the, the correct time to do it, particularly if they're unstable. But thanks for bringing this forward and uh, glad to see you in person. You're just up the, up the state from me there. So good to see you. You too. Thank you. Can I make a comment? Sure. Hi. Yeah, hi. Okay. All right. So, of course, you know, we are dealing with a very septic patient who clearly has got uh, uh, contamination of the abdominal cavity is uh, septic for sure, and you are in the middle of the night. Um, I think we should deal, I agree with uh, Dr. Morton, with damage control. So controlling the sepsis, first of all, as you would do with uh, a Boerab syndrome. If you get an esoph esophageal perforation in the middle of the night, you're not going to do an esophagectomy, right? And I think it's the same principle if you find a giant, uh, giant perforated ulcer, you should do a very good washout. So all the basic, a bit of the bri debridement of the tissue and probably leave a big drain or a foley catheter inside the ulcer to drain it outside to create a fistula. This is what I would think. Um, um, to that, I would add whether we should consider putting a feeding jejunostomy or a tube in the remnant at the same time to get some nutrition because in addition to controlling sepsis, I think nutrition is, is a very important element and which would help with healing eventually. So that's the other thing you would probably want to consider while doing the, the, the index procedure. It's exactly 3 a.m. in Australia, so I, hopefully I don't get called now for this <laughs> problem. So, uh, but you know, lucky we got a few fellows working with us, and they are pretty competent. A lot of the time, um, we kind of don't need to get out of bed for that. But, uh, but I think the principle is the same as any acute sepsis management, like what all the other people say about washout and drains and things like this. But I think drain is quite important in a sense that I think. You know, you have to tell them not to use uh, small drains, the bigger, the better. I think, you know, the numbers also is important, depends on area of contaminations. I mean, the one thing you should illustrate is that you probably need to differentiate what type of um, bypass you have. Um, I mean, in Australia, the bypass rate is only about 15 to 20 percent, so it's not that high, but, and there's variety of them because the perforated houses from a rule on why gastric bypass do behave differently than a single anastomosis bypass with pancreatic juice and bowel juice around. I mean, and thankfully a lot of these patients are usually has lost a significant amount of weight. So they are usually skinnier and easier to manage. Um, but I think the principle is either closures or drainage. I think that's the most important thing and a thorough washout and prepare to have the endoscopy set up and et cetera, et cetera. One other option that we try sometimes here in Brazil, maybe not for the specific case, is the endoscopic vacuum drainage. So instead of only draining to the outside, we can try an endoluminal vacuum, which is very easy to do and very cheap, even if you don't have much endoscopic skills. If you have an endoscope, maybe you can try. Ben, any comments? <clears throat> I think we all agreed that in that specific situation, we wouldn't repair or redo the anastomosis in a patient who is septic. We all agree on that. Okay. So, I mean, all of these options ran into my mind, you know, wash out, leave drains, uh, closure over, uh, you know, a T-tube, uh, form a fistula, approximation of mental patch. It was kind of, you know, the patient at the time was, you know, pretty stable, wasn't hypotensive, wasn't on any press or just communicating with anesthesia. And 
um, you know, thought about, you know, feeding access, leaving drains, all that. Um, so eventually that's what I did. So you can see here, I mean, it's, it was just very, very hard to uh, kind of get around the anastomosis, uh, just very thick grind between the, um, uh, the remnant stomach and the anastomosis posteriorly. And, uh, you know, thinking about where the vessels are, the gastric vessels, um, just not to, you know, divide them. <clears throat> so I was just trying to figure out if I can get around uh, the anastomosis um, here. Um, just doing some blunt dissection. Um, just trying to figure out what the anatomy is. Um, and I'm going to try to see if I can move the video along. Um, but all of these things went through my mind is to try and, you know, uh, get out of the OR. Uh, you know, but I was, I got a little greedy when, you know, I knew that the patient was a little more, uh, stable, um, just doing this. And here I kind of broke through in the back, uh, getting behind, um, behind it. And at that point I just decided to divide it completely because it was just, um, it was just literally less than a centimeter band of tissue between the, the pouch and, um, and the rule limb, <clears throat> you can see here the you know pouch has very very thick, has very um, thick inflammatory tissue. And Geraldine here can see me thinking about should I put this together? Should I not put it together? Um, uh, and then it's, I mean, I didn't have uh, somebody at the time to you know get a get a hand or you know get an extra set of eyes, but. I thought about it a lot. I've seen a couple of those situations in my fellowship, which, you know, we were on the aggressive side and sometimes we were on the conservative side. Um, so I had kind of the experience of both. And um, <clears throat> so here I'm kind of just trying to get lateral uh, dissection um, of the pouch just to see if I'm able to at least divide that area of inflammatory uh, tissue at the anastomosis. But at the end of the day, I wasn't able to, um, to circumferentially dissect the pouch. Um, I think, you know, with these, a sharp dissection is, you know, always better. You get, you know, more bleeding sometimes, but, um, and here trying to just freshen the edges, uh, seeing what my options are. I usually do a, a hand-sewn gastrogenostomy. Um, <clears throat> and this was a hand-sewn gastrogenostomy. <clears throat> Uh, but here I decided to do this. Um, I couldn't really get a good purchase on the posterior aspect of the, of the, um, of the pouch, but, um, I at least was able to get like some side to side alignment, um, of the pouch and the, um, and the rule limb. Um, you can see here, I got a little bit of, you know, some posterior wall. Uh, but most of the circumference of the anastomos was still open and I decided to just hand sew the rest of it. Um, and this is, this was an absorbable barb suture, uh, 3O. And that's what I use usually for most of my, um, my hand sewn anastomosis. <clears throat> and here just kind of finishing off, um, that layer. And I only did the, the circumference of this only in one layer. Uh, because I didn't think that there was any room with the tissue edema and inflammation to do. And then uh, basically brought a piece of omentum, put around the anastomosis, um, and then put a feeding gastrostomy tube in the remnant at the end. Um, got an upper GI postoperative date number one. Uh, there was no leak. It looked okay. So we fed the patient uh, just with clear liquids and used the feeding um, uh, gastrostomy tube uh, to supplement. Uh, you can see the feeding gastrostomy tube here. Um, so I think it's a good discussion because, um, you know, there are some options, like everyone said, um, just damage control, endoscopy, um, drains, um, trying to do something more aggressive. Um, uh, but it all depends on how clinically uh, the patient is doing. And I'm going to stop right there. Um, and I don't know if we want to have take questions now or later. I have to admire your uh, braveness <laughs> in doing this because uh, it's, uh, the tissues are not ideal. And I can see you probably um, you know, sweating a little bit when you fire the stapler because there's very high chances the stapler won't take 
and you're ending up with uh, less tissues. And, and also the dissection is pretty good as well, because I think let's not remind ourselves with the little things behind it called a spleen and, you know, some major vessels at the back in the pancreas and, and God forbid, if you knock off the left gastric, then you're really running out of options. So, so that's a, uh, that's very brave move. Um, nice job, Henny. I, I really think that this has been clap. I really think this just shows the utility of knowing how to sew laparoscopically. And it's, you know, it should be a, essentially it should be a required skill for fellows coming out because even if the stapler misfired, you have the ability as a surgeon to, to take care of most problems that you're going to encounter. So, you know, leaving besides all the resuscitation and everything, I think just that skill level that the, that the bariatric surgeon needs, um, I think it's an absolute must that they sew laparoscopically. Nice job. I couldn't agree more with, uh, with Ben on that point. That's an absolutely critical skill set. And um, I think the only other point here to make is if you remember the original description of the Graham patch by Roscoe Graham, um, you are not supposed to close the hole. Uh, you take a bite of either side and you put that tongue of momentum in the middle and then you sandwich it in because the tissue can be quite friable. That's the traditional way. Sometimes you may have a defect that's so large that it's hard to close. One other consideration is a thal patch, which is where you use a small portion of the small bowel and it can kind of fix on there. I got to say most of these perfed ulcer operations are extremely dissatisfying. You go in there and wash out, you pull off the omentum that God has already put on there and then you put it right back on. But this is a nice job about being careful, not doing too much because the tissue can be very friable, but good job. Thank you. Wonderful, great video session. So let's pass it on now uh, to Professor Mario Musella, who's going to present our next uh, discussion. Yes, yes, thank you, thank you, Ariel. It's my pleasure to introduce you, uh, Professor Sandy Pagarwal that is going to give us a talk um, about, I'm um, sorry, can you see me? Yes, now we can. Okay, sorry. So it's my pleasure to introduce you, Professor Sandy Pagarwal from India, that is going to give us a talk about if the, the surveillance, uh, endoscopic surveillance is indicated, it should be routine after mini gastric bypass to uh, detect uh, marginal ulcers. Please, Sandeep. And uh, before we go ahead, I just want to present his discussion uh, expert forum, which starts off with Professor Phil Schauer from the United States. He is co-founder of IBC. It's an honor to have uh, him with us today. Uh, he's at the Mary Kay and Terrell Brown Harris J. Uh, Schuss Chair, Professor of Metabolic Surgery at Pennington Biomedical Research Center, Louisiana State University, USA formerly Chief of Bariatric Surgery at Cleveland Clinic, Ohio, and Chief of Bariatric Surgery at the University of Pittsburgh Med UCLSL Center, uh, McGee Women's Hospital USA, and past president of the ASMBS, the American Society for Bar Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery. We also have with us Dr. Robert Rutledge from the United States. He is inventor of the mini gastric bypass operation for the treatment of severe obesity first described in 1997, formerly professor of general trauma, critical care, and bariatric surgery at the University of North Carolina in the United States. He's also associate chief of staff and first chief of the section of medical information in the Department of Surgery in the University of North Carolina, founder and director of North, North Carolina Trauma Registry. Welcome to you. We also have Dr. Sonia Ciappetta from Italy. She is head of obesity and metabolic surgery unit, center of excellence, Ospedale Evangelico Betania in Naples, Italy. Welcome. We also have Professor Carl Reinwald from Germany, head of the Department of Obesity and Metabolic and Plastic Surgery at St. Franziskus Hospital, Cologne, Germany. Specialist for nutritional medicine and sports medicine, president of 2019 International MGB OAGB Club Congress, and president of the annual MGB OAGB Consensus Conference in 2019. 
We also have Professor Safwan Taha from the United Arab Emirates. He is consultant, laparoscopic, bariatric, and metabolic surgeon, director of the Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery Center, and medical director, Mediclinic Airport Road Hospital, Abu Dhabi, in the UAE. He is governor of the UAE chapter of the American College of Surgeons, governor at large, board of governors of the American College of Surgeons in Chicago. Welcome to you. And we also have Professor Caetano Marquesini from Brazil, former president of the Brazilian Society of Bariatric and Metabolic Surgery. And Dr. Umar Ganem from the United States, attending uh, minimally invasive surgery and bariatric surgeon at the Mayo Clinicer, Clinic in Rochester, United States. He is editorial board of SWORD, Leadership Roles in Sages, and America's Hernia Society. And Professor Matias Fobi from the USA and India, Director of Clinical Affairs and Research at Mohawk Bariatrics and Robotics in Dore, India, Clinical Professor of Surgery in Sri Aurobindo Medical College and Postgraduate Institute in Dore, India, Founding President of the Bariatric Corporation, Bariat. Tech Corporation, and member and past chair of IFSO Board of Trustees, president of IFSO 2008, and president of the ASMBS Foundation 2006 to 2008. I will now pass it on to Professor Sandeep. Uh, yeah, hi everyone. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Harris, for this kind invitation and uh, Dr. Musella for the introduction. I'm really honored to be a part of this esteemed panel and initiate the discussion on this uh, topic which Harris has given me. Uh, should surveillance endoscopy be routine after minigastric bypass to detect marginal ulcers? So, uh, you know, this was the, I think the paper we published very recently in obesity surgery, which was sort of the focal point of this discussion in which we sort of, uh, you know, uh, endoscoped uh, 57 patients who were eligible for a year follow-up after OAGB, among whom about three-fourths consented for a surveillance endoscopy. Four patients developed marginal ulcer, uh, all less than five millimeter, all were asymptomatic and non-smokers. Three of them healed completely on a repeat endoscopy on conservative management, and one, one patient was lost to follow-up. So uh, the questions I'll be discussing with the panel are, uh, you know, is the problem of marginal ulcer significant enough to warrant surveillance? And should the surveillance be routine or selective? And then we'll take on from there, you know, various from where the panel dis uh, discussion goes on. If you look at the challenges of the marginal ulcer, there's a wide variation in reported incidence depending on length of follow-up. And it's a complex issue. And one of the mo most important issues is a conflicting literature on the etiology. I mean, that's the most, you know, confusing aspect of the, uh, you know, marginal ulcer is the varying etiology which leads to marginal ulcer. And again, there's a wide variation of disease severity and impact is poorly understood. And last but not last, the least, there's a high rate of recurrence following treatment and surgical intervention. So this is some of the recent data and giving, uh, you know, the incidence of marginal ulcer after OAGB, which is more or less comparable, and maybe a little less than RU and gastric bypass. Uh, although, the, again, since a lot of patients are asymptomatic, the actual incidence may be higher than reported. Since most of the patients are just treated medically based on vague upper abdominal symptoms without any endoscopic evaluation. And this is, again, a paper which of a large cohort of patients from New York State database, which showed that, uh, you know, marginal ulcer rate, this is from the RUNY bypass, uh, incidence of 6.28% and about 10% requiring surgical intervention. And we all know the morbidity uh, of a marginal ulcer, untreated marginal ulcer, and how it can lead to a significant morbidity for the patient. And the, the supposed advantage of surveillance would include prevention of complications, which I just mentioned in the previous slide, identify and modify risk factors, treat these patients, hence decreasing the need for surgical intervention, and hence reduce morbidity. So let me ask now, stop here and ask Dr. Phil Shah, Professor Phil Shah. So would you recommend routine uh, surveillance endoscopy after OAGB? And if your answer is yes, then when and what, what intervals? Dr. Shah? Hello. Sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> you know, with an incidence of, you know, 3%, that's, 
that's fairly low uh, to do routinely. On the other hand, for those people that have risk factors for marginal ulcer, people that have a history of smoking or on NSAIDs, perhaps alcohol, you know, I think you can make the case for individuals who, uh, who may be higher risk than others. But routine surveillance, you'd have to do a lot of scopes you know, on an annual basis. And it seems to me that would be a long run for a short slide. So, so I think the high risk patients, I probably would consider that. Okay. Uh, so the answer is no to a routine surveillance endoscopy and you should do it only in high risk groups. And we'll discuss this aspect later on. Dr. Rutledge, would you defer or would you have the same answer? I would uh, not do routine surveillance. Okay. Uh, Dr. Uh, Sonia Shapta. Am I pronouncing your name right? Sonia. In my opinion, I agree with uh, Phil Shawa that only the high-risk patients uh, should undergo um, endoscopic surveillance. But uh, I have to say, in these high-risk patients, I do not perform gastric bypass. So uh, maybe it's better to perform sleeve gastrectomy to do not have the risk in the future. OK, any of the panelists have a different sort of opinion on this? We heard the three, you know. I do, I, well, I'm sorry. I, I really do have a different opinion uh, yeah. because, you know, I'm an endoscopist. I do surveillance endoscopy in all my patients here in Brazil. We do mostly BRI gastric bypasses, but I can tell you guys that the numbers are much higher than you see in the literature because what you're doing is examining patients that are symptomatic. And if you put together the numbers of the asymptomatic patients, maybe you can get a big, bigger, bigger number. So I believe that yes, we should do, we do it in Brazil. The problem is, and the real matter about the discussion is that in some countries, it's not so expensive to do it. It's not so difficult to do it. And it, like here where I, I work, it's not really a, a big deal uh, doing it. But I know that like United States, the costs are really high and there are some difficulties to, you know, to have the, the access of doing surveillance endoscopy. But uh, uh, I really do believe so, you so, have to. So Dr. Marchi Singh, uh, uh, when, uh, what time interval after the OAGB would you recommend? Since well, I do in my, yeah, I wouldn't change what I do for my root and eye gastric bypass. Here in Brazil, we're not doing OAGBs, only small centers are doing it, but I wouldn't change it because I've been reading a lot of literature about OAGB. Maybe it's the bariatric surgery that's more studied in the last five years. You have a lot of literature around it. And I wouldn't change what I do here. I do in my patients for re and y gastric bypasses six months and one year after. And then for the second year, I do it again. And then after that, I do, don't do it anymore. And right. I really get involved on these patients, somatic syndromatic uh, ulcers. And mostly when we do have some complications that are bleeding and perforation, these patients do not complain previous symptoms. So this is another issue that the complications come usually from patients that uses NSAIDs or, or smokers and they don't have any complaints or don't value the, the, the symptoms they have because of the habits they have, eating habits. So I think it is important to do surveillance in those people. Well, I, 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 I understand I wanna, you would do it more often in the first two years because uh, you know, chances of marginal are more. Dr. Phoebe, yes. uh, you do a lot of endoscopies in your center in India. What is your opinion about surveillance endoscopy? Dr. Phoebe, can you hear me? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, so we uh, do. Yeah. yeah, you know, we instituted a routine uh, surveillance endoscopy. Uh, from October 2018. And uh, we have found out that the incidence of marginal ulcers is much higher than reported because we do not only do symptomatic patients, we do all comers. We can analyze our data right now because when we did all comers, we endoscope patients at three months, six months, one year, and then beyond, depending on the patients who are willing to have endoscopies. Based on that, the first 126 patients who had endoscopic surveillance showed that we had about a 16% incidence of marginal ulcers after one anastomosis gastric bypass and about a 7% after gastric bypass. But as surveillance is not for marginal ulcers, your question is kind of skewed. 
we recommend routine surveillance because with one anastomosis gastric bypass, we are worried about marginal ulcers, GERD, and other things, barrier the suffer goes with it. So that's why we do routine. But if we we're just gonna do it for marginal ulcers, maybe your yield is not gonna be as much. Okay. So Dr. Omar wants to make a comment, I think. Yeah. Dr. Omar? Yeah, yeah. I think uh, in theory, with the fact that uh, mini gastric bypass has a bilirubin II uh, morphology or anatomy, uh, the chance or incidence of uh, ulcers should be less in principle. That said, just to avoid the uh, bile reflux to the esophagus, uh, by design, the pouch was made longer, so higher chance of acids or parietal cells in that pouch. Also, to make it a low pressure system, uh, the anastomosis is wider, 4.5 centimeters. So just the dysphysiology of, of that the mini gastric bypass creates, uh, while talking about ulcers here, uh, because of the wider anastomosis, more jejunal mucosa, because of the longer pouch, more parietal cells. So that effect that we should have from the B2 anatomy goes off. I mean, it's, we see, we're seeing a chance of 16%, like Professor Phobe mentioned, or 10%, in, as you mentioned in your paper, which is comparable to the root on my gastric bypass. Uh, which is, uh, again, in literature is about 8 to 12%. So again, by design, it should be protective, but to avoid the bile reflux effect to the esophagus, it was made a longer pouch, wider anastomosis, more jejunal, uh, jejunal mucosa uh, that is uh, uh, um, uh, really uh, getting exposed to the high acidity of the pouch. Not to forget two other things. We don't know what the effect of the vagal transection uh, uh, on the lesser curve side is doing to the to the um, uh, remnant stomach hormones and uh, as well as the bile acid uh, production uh, in 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 the um, BP limb. Also, we don't know the what the length of the biliopancreatic limb, what kind of effect it has, and and what is the bile acids that are reaching that anastomosis, what is the concentration and how much of a protective effect they lose with the longer BP limb uh, that there is. That so as I understand, Omar, Dr. Omar, you are in favor of doing a surveillance endoscopy in view of the uh, high reported uh, incidence. I, I would say yes, except that most doctors after mini gastric bypass put patients on PPIs. Uh, Dr. Mahawa reported in clinical obesity 2017, 85% of surgeons put patients on PPIs. So for yeah. those asymptomatic patients, what are you going to do differently? They already are on PPIs. You're not going to reverse them for asymptomatic ulcers. So that is the underside of it. So that was my subsequent point. So would you do it after you stop PPIs? Uh, let's say you give it for three months. So you do, you do the surveillance at six months. Uh, maybe we can or, ask Dr. Taha, uh, Taha on it. Maybe Dr. Professor Taha can come on it. Well, I'll, I'll come to that. Surveillance endoscopy, would you do it after you stop your, you know, initial yeah. prophylactic? Yes. Well, I, I'm, 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 pro I'm sorry, but I'm very sorry to be the devil's advocate here because, I mean, all the things that we're talking about are, I mean, sound great. All the theory behind it sounded great. But if you're working somewhere where I work, where, you, where your load is 98% insurance and you get, uh, you know, uh, you, you get into fights, literally, you get approval for pre-op endoscopy for ruin y gastric bypass or for a patient who is having dyspepsia, but he is not so obese after a previous operation. And now you are operating just to divert the bile and the insurance sees no indication. I mean, it will be really, really, I tell you, 100% rejection if I ask for endoscopy for an asymptomatic patient following bariatric surgery. I, I guess the, the, real, the real question would be, I, I don't know about practices elsewhere. The, the real question for us working in mostly insurance dominated practice is for what, what you need is help from other centers who are referral centers or they have certain grants or budgets to come up with data because the, the easiest part for us here with insurance is when you, when you show them the IFSO or the ASMBS guidelines and then that's a different issue. So you can really talk about it. I generally, I generally don't give my patients routinely uh, PPIs, only those who are willing to pay for it because insurance never approves it without, without symptoms. I, I mean, from the evident data, I would go for, I mean, if I had the means, I would go for a year, definitely. Okay. 
So I think so more or less the house is divided on that. And maybe you can take the next part which Dr. Phil Shah raised about endoscopy uh, in high-risk patients. So now let's see what do you mean by high-risk, you know. And that's a way, area where a lot of, uh, uh, you know, uh, overlap is there. A lot of confusing literature is there. And this is a recent paper from Rodriguez who looked at the mechanism of uh, risk factors of marginal ulcer. And we all know that. Diabetes, mellitus, hypertension, obstructive sleep apnea, previous history of peptic ulcer disease, H. polarized, smoking, uh, chronic use of NSAIDs, and various surgical aspects. Now, let me ask Dr. Carl Rainwald. Uh, what group of high risk, what do you consider as high risk? Is it a single factor or a combination of factors? If it's a combination, then what combination of factors? Uh, okay, thanks for this difficult question. I think we don't, we don't have real evidence on this. We don't have evidence uh, what is a high risk patient, but we, we all know these factors and we should avoid on operating on high risk patients, uh, as you mentioned. So uh, in my center, we don't do uh, gastric bypass uh, and we don't do OHEB in, in smokers who deny uh, stop smoking uh, b before surgery. Of course, a lot of them will, will restart surgery and then we see about 50% of uh, marginal ulcer complications uh, are in smokers, but 50% are not uh, as well. So um, that's one of one of the issues. But uh, concerning your endoscopy in Germany, we got uh, almost the same situation as in as in Egypt. I we, we can't and we have the problem of compliance of patients. They will they will never come having routine uh, endoscopy like three six months one year after surgery, but we do recommend now having a surveillance uh, gastroscopy uh, like two years after surgery, uh, but mainly as Dr. Phoebe said, to uh, also for the reflux issue to have some uh, some security uh, concerning silent uh, esophagitis, silent uh, bile reflux or so. As actually we do in sleeve gastrectomy, it's the same uh, same problem in sleeve gastrectomy. So okay, so uh, so you think uh, you you're suggesting you better not do a bypass in patient with high risk factors. Let's go back to Dr. Shar again. You mentioned you would be happy to do surveillance endoscopies in patients with high risks. And uh, so let's say so let's hear your opinion of what you consider as high risk where you would do a roti, you know, surveillance endoscopy at some interval. Yeah, well, I mean, I think the risk factors have been identified. We all know, you know, smoking and NSAID use, H. pylori. Now, to the extent possible, some of those are modifiable, you know, before surgery. Um, so if they can stop those things beforehand, that's that's the best option. But as just mentioned, um, uh, that some patients will restart some of these bad habits afterwards. So <laughs> in that situation, you do the best you can to convince them to stop their bad habits. You know, stop smoking, stop the uh, NSAID use, stop the alcohol. Um, to the extent that you cannot, you know, uh, you know, modify those risk factors, you know, that's the group that probably should have endoscopy. But I must say, you know, surveillance endoscopy is, is not practical. <laughs> it's very challenging to, uh, to follow these patients and schedule their surgery every year and have adherence to that. Uh, so it is an ideal goal, but it is not very practical. Right, I would agree to that. And uh, but let's talk about diabetes. In the recent paper uh, from uh, you know, in the initial of surgery, uh, they said diabetes is you know has a maximum risk along with the history of peptic ulcer disease. So would you agree with this viewpoint that you should scope the diabetics maybe even if they're you know getting better after bariatric surgery? Again, I know your view. You already said that it's not practical. But would you agree with that paper if you've seen that uh, that oh, diabetes? The question is, I think you're assuming is diabetes not a modifiable risk factor? I say it is, because a lot of the operations that we do put these patients into long-term remission. Sure. So I take issue with this notion 
that patients with diabetes after metabolic surgery are, you know, are still at risk for marginal ulcer because in many cases, well, almost always their diabetes is better and a significant percentage of the time we put them into remission. Yes, but that's what the NS paper said for, for more than 20,000 patients with a, you know, ha hazard ratio of around 2.5, if I'm remembering correctly. So let's go to Dr. Rutledge now. Dr. Rutledge, would you now, can you, would you do surveillance endoscopy in high-risk groups? Uh, maybe smokers or, or a combination of high-risk factors as is, as uh, we sort of mentioned in the earlier slides, Dr. Rutledge? No, I think especially in India, you know, there's a cost benefit and the uh, other points are that a lot of the risk factors are modified by the operation. If I could, I'll mention something else, which I think has been left out. And that is the <clears throat> fact that the majority of the ulcers are found relatively early. And uh, we've talked a lot about acid. And um, I think in general, there is a significant decrease in the acid load placed on the mucosa of the RUI and the MGD stomach pouches. My own experience in working with patients and surgeons and training them is we found that some surgeons seem to have an oddly high rate of marginal ulcers and others seem to have quite a low rate. And there also seems to be a experience factor. And so um, one thing I haven't heard mentioned very often is the risk of ischemia. Um, my feeling is that uh, focus on the vascular supply to the gastrojejunostomy is an under recognized problem for the development of marginal ulcer. You know, marginal ulcer certainly can occur late, particularly in smokers as has been pointed out. But the early ulcers, I think, uh, especially from the videos when I've worked with surgeons who are adopting MGD, or when I get patients or surgeons who've had a complication and we're able to look at the videos, my bias is that surgical technique often violates the principle of having a well vascularized tissue on either side of an anastomosis when you do GI surgery. Uh, Dr. Phobi, uh, uh, so uh, I think the, one of the previous speakers showed Dr. Kamal Mahawa's paper about extended prophylaxis of up to five years. And uh, maybe most of the people of us would agree up to two years, five years is too long. So would you say it's better to do a surveillance endoscopy rather than putting the patient on extended PPIs, uh, Dr. Phobi? Yeah, uh, this is a complicated issue because we don't have the data. At Moha, we're trying to generate the data. Uh, when I looked at the statistics at Mohawk, before I started routine endoscopies, we did not have too many patients coming in with complaints of marginal ulcers. And then when we started the routine endoscopies, only about 2% of the patients came in complaining on whom we found marginal ulcers. So the other 14.6% had no complaints and that was an endoscopic finding. So they, we're talking here and the reason is we don't have the data and people are being dogmatic. If you don't look, you don't find. Right. And if you look, you might find too much. So okay. we have to have an open uh, uh, mind about this. So talk about- Maybe that's why people support. don't look. <laughs> well, when you don't look, you don't find, yes. But again, when people find, don't uh, condemn them for finding or saying they're doing something wrong. Yep. Because as I said, I came and I can tell you looking at the data we looked at, we had a very low rate of bile esophagitis complaining, low rate of marginal ulcers. But when we started doing the endoscopies, we found it was different. So there are many patients who have, so at this time it should be a research topic for those who can right. do it to document it for the rest of us. I think we look forward to your publication, which you know is showing this high rate of marginal and, ulcers. And Dr. Fabi, I totally agree with you because we cannot pretend it doesn't exist because we don't do the exam. So this is a big issue. I think it is a problem. I understand some countries has, has problems in doing surveillance endoscopy, but we can't pretend it, the problem doesn't exist because we're not able to do the exams. This is something important you just raised on the conversation. So Dr. Marchesini, uh, so, since you were, you say uh, routine surveillance endoscopy is desirable, would you be more you know, strict about it in high risk groups? And if yes, you know, which groups, let's say, we know all know smokers have a high risk. Let's talk about patients with on non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs or diabetics. Are you more strict 
on doing an endoscopy in these patients? You're more, you know, regular? What, or... what, you know, what, what we do in our service here, we do, we're doing bariatric surgery for 25 years, almost 30, 27 years. And what we do basically here is give the, the patient the most information we can do about the possible complications he will probably or confront during, during his year, probable years. Because the thing is, and the problem we have is the follow-up. All of us has this problem. After two years, we lost a big number of patients. After five years, it's ridiculous what we're doing in terms of follow-up. So what we are doing now, and I think that what's helping the patients now, it's the internet and all the information we're putting out, is telling the patient, look, you may have this, this, and this. And if see, you have this and this symptom, please come to our service or go after an endoscopist or go after a service that specializes in bariatric surgery. Do not go to a place that they don't understand the surgery because they, don't, they won't know how to, to manage it. So this is one of the things that it's most important of everything. You tell the patient what are the problems he may encounter during his life and where he has to go to get some help. I think this is the most important thing. Okay. So any other panelist has an opinion about the risk factors? Which factor do they consider the most important besides smoking? We all know that smoking is important. Let's say H. pylori. Dr. Uh, Sonia, uh, do you think H. pylori is associated with increased marginal ulcer? And do you routinely eradicate this bacteria before surgery? Yeah, I have to say I eradicate in all my patients prior to surgery um, helicobacter in all patients. Um, I recommend to avoid smoking. I recommend um, deeply to avoid NSAIDs. So I think uh, these are the three most important um, things to do. The prevention, we have to uh, focus on prevention because we can't do um, surveillance in, in all our patients. Um, the high volume centers, um, the, the specialized endoscopists can do it to have data, to publish data. But I have to say in the normal life, uh, we, have to, yeah, we have to go okay. over. So, Dr. Reinwald, a supposing patient has to have an NCIDs. Would you do a surveillance endoscopy? Because they are li likely to have, suppose they have to have those drugs. Uh, Dr. Reinwald? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, thanks for this question. Actually, we, we recommend uh, taking these drugs only for the shortest uh, period uh, possible. So say two or three weeks under coverage, under protection with, uh, with PPI at that time, but we strongly uh, recommend not taking these drugs like uh, ibuprofen or, or diclofenac or so on a, on a, long, on a long run. Uh, we strictly forbid uh, aspirin, of course, that's, a, that's the worst of all the drugs, as we, as we know. Uh, but we would not operate on a patient, on a rheumatic patient, for instance, who needs uh, uh, NSRI for for on a on a long run. So uh, in these cases, we would go for sleeve gastrectomy. Okay. So I'll just uh, show you some data on the risk factors. I mean, this is again from large population cohort studies, more than thirty thousand cases. And among the risk factors, the treatment for diabetes at one year and a surgical factors like a large pouch and a prolonged operative time was found to be important. And they also found that PPI prophylaxis did not increase risk of marginal ulcers. Uh, is it going now? It's not moving. Can you hear me? This uh, regarding the aspirin, I think my slides are not moving. Hmm. Can you see my screen, please? Yeah, we can. You may yeah. have to unshare and share again. Okay. Not moving. I can see it. It was okay. Right. Right. Okay. No, I think it's not moving. I'll stop share. So, uh, so again, again, uh, the data about aspirin is very interesting. I mean, the low dose aspirin is found to be actually beneficial in some of the studies, and only the high dose aspirin has been found to be a problem for marginal ulcer. Now, let's now let's compare now uh, what what prophylaxis PPI prophylaxis. Do you think, Dr. Omar, that it helps in preventing marginal ulcers? Uh, and then, if, uh, yes. How long? Because there are some studies we say they don't, like one I was about to show you. But uh, if 
Well, how long do you give PPI prophylaxis? And uh, I raised my hand just to comment on the uh, on the modifiable risk factors. We talked about the patient's modifiable risk factors. We didn't talk about the technical modifier risk factors by the surgeon. And uh, Dr. Rutledge kind of commented on that. Uh, I, I felt there is some kind of a blame for the surgeons who do that. But it's it's sometimes there is uh, just the techniques we use. I feel. From our experience at Mayo Clinic doing uh, hands-on anastomosis, I do a full hands-on anastomosis myself. From our experience before, using a permanent suture caused more, uh, more ulcers and more stenosis, in fact. And uh, that's why we changed to Vicryl. Now, recently, uh, even Vicryl, uh, it might have some inflammatory <clears throat> effect. And uh, uh, we are, uh, some of the uh, surgeons who do hands-on anastomosis, including Higgins group, just changed recently to using PDS, for that reason, just because it is less inflammatory and might be associated with less ulcers. I haven't seen as much ulcers with Vicryl being an absorbable suture, but again, that is an interesting point also to check what are the modifiable risk factors that the surgeon can introduce with the technique. Now the staple that is used, surely that's permanent material. If any one of us, and I'm sure all we did, we scoped early after an operation you saw, uh, done by staple anastomosis, you see those staples coming out into the intraluminal area. I, I, do, not, I do not think this is a something to be neglected. This is important. So modifiable risks uh, or risk factors by the surgeon's technique themselves <coughs> is important. Going back to your question, uh, we do give PPIs uh, for some uh, for a period of three months after our uh, row and Y gastric bypass patients. There is a good study uh, that you already highlighted on, uh, uh, and I, I believe it's a meta-analysis. Now, it's a meta-analysis of some bad studies, unfortunately, but that's what is available in literature, and we do give three uh, months of PPI prophylaxis afterwards for that matter. Dr. Taha, uh, do you have any difference? Thanks opinion a lot, actually. Really? I have a question to uh, Dr. Sonia. I mean, she said that she eradicates H. pylori from every single patient that she operates upon. So what's what's the approach? I mean, you, you scope them all, take tissue biopsy, and then give medication and scope them again, or it's a breath mm -hmm. test, or what are the criteria through which you eradicate every single patient uh, with from H. pylori? I'd, lo I'd love to, to know that, really. So um, every patient who has a positive uh, pylori. <laughs> um, so every patient in my center gets a preoperative upper endoscopy um, with a biopsy. When biopsy is positive for Helicobacter pylori, um, I recommend uh, Pilera um, for 10 days and um, they repeat um, brief test. Even if they are asymptomatic? Yes. But you know, Roughly 66% of people who have nothing will have a positive uh, H. pylori test. So wouldn't that be a bit overdoing it? I don't know. I'm just asking. I don't know. I have to say um, I have worked uh, for 10 years with uh, Rudolf Weiner and um, we did upper endoscopy um, one day before surgery. And now um, I am doing upper endoscopy um, yeah, when two months, uh, six weeks prior to surgery because I have so many patients and um, have to organize. And with this um, uh, yeah, flow chart, I'm going uh, well. I do not have seen um, so many ulcers, so um, I go on with it. Maybe I'm over treating, but... Uh, I would have done, I would have done that. I would have done the same thing had my insurance uh, covered it. But I think if you do have the coverage, of course, I think through experiences like yourself and other people who do, like Professor Phoebe, who do uh, a routine uh, uh, endoscopies, probably in a couple of years or three years, we can come up with data that can support us people who work under insurance. Thank you. Uh, so there's a question from the, I think one of the surgeons that should we offer a bypass to patient on chronic NSAIDs uh, or the uh, you know, drug modulators like for rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, what is the opinion of the panel on that? Would you want anybody wants to take an answer on that? I think yes, you can. Uh, at one point in the United States, the only surgery we had was a gastric bypass, <laughs> and so we operated on all patients, those who were on arthritic medicines, those who were on steroids, and when we looked at the data, it was not that significant. Uh, that's on pay. 
So Dr. Yes, Fubi, I was just showing mm. showing this NSH slide. NSH had more authors. So I was just showing this slide. Can I share this slide for a while uh, while you speak? Uh, so this is Go a ahead. paper again from a very large database showing a current chronic NCID use as the most significant factor. I remember the odds ratio was more than 10. Uh, and among all the factors in this, such a large cohort. So I would uh, I agree with the, uh, I mean, uh, this would be my opinion and other panelists can comment that maybe we should not be offering a bypass procedure. Dr. Phil Shah uh, on this. Yeah, we know um, a lot of these folks uh, with the weight loss, their arthritis gets better. So many of the patients, you can get them off their NSAIDs. Um, so that's an important point. Uh, but the ones that do need long-term NSAIDs um, or anti-inflammatory drugs, I would probably, I would put them on extended PPI prophylaxis and um, perhaps in addition, um, a cytoprotective agent like Carifate, you know, in okay. addition. So I would prophylact those folks. And that's the group. If you're going to offer surveillance, that's the group where you should survey the patients. Okay. Yeah. So any, any, any panelist who would refuse a bypass to such patients, any, anyone? I would say okay, well, uh, I won't do a bypass. I, I, I actually, I actually would. I, I do this, this, this that uh, Phil just told. We have uh, a, a, a number of patients that do use NSAIDs chronically, and uh, we do use PPIs chronically too, as the same. So it is important. We know it is a risk factor. So it seems that to... we can offer a bypass with with cover of an extended PPI slash sucralfate. Is that right? Yes, I do agree. I think there's no problem for OAGP or for you. Can, you can put you, you have to put on the table the benefits of the surgery here, not right. only because uh, of the maleficence of the surgery and the benefits it? of surgery. Well, just said these patients will get much better from their arthritis and their their problems uh, of, 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 of using NSAID. So the, they will diminish the use of it. So the, I think there's no problem in taking care of these patients with more. Uh, looking there more closely and taking care of them and telling them the risks of using these drugs. Right. Dr. Fobi, you were saying something? Yes, uh, you were quoting the paper. I, I've looked up this topic. Do we have anybody that has published on patients who presented with symptomatic marginal ulcers after gastric bypass and show the correlation between taking NSH and the incidence of ulcers? I couldn't find that reference. Uh, I think I just showed this paper, which is looking yeah, at I remember marginal that one ulcers paper. only. Uh, 35,000 patients, or uh, let's say, with marginal ulceration uh, who have undergone bariatric surgery. Uh, so this is a pretty large cohort of marginal ulcer patients, not only you know the bariatric surgery patients. So I mean, we need to have a closer look at the paper. And probably this is the only paper which has shown this. Yeah. So maybe we need to have a look at the other papers. Uh, I'll just throw up an idea, uh, you know, if uh, this is my... Can I, just, can I just address this other thing about uh, H. pylori? Yeah. yeah. When I looked at the incidence of H. pylori, when I came to India, I came from the United States where we did H. pylori tests routinely and eradicated positive tests with antibiotic and other medications before surgery. When I arrived at Mohawk, they had done about 7,000 cases and they were not doing H. pylori tests. I kind of got irritated. I got very rambunctious. And then I looked at that data and I didn't see that they had any particular problem with marginal ulcers. Maybe we're treating something we think would be happening, which we don't really need to. I just thought I'll bring that point up. Right. Okay. So again, as this paper from Dr. Mahawa showed that there's no conclusive evidence to prove that eradication of H. pylori reduces marginal ulcer rates. And I've seen a lot of literature which is on both sides. So uh, this, is, this is again an equivocal sort of a risk factor. Uh, yeah. Again, uh, I think I'll just throw up, uh, you know, uh, this idea of this, this paper from Sweden. This showed that, you know, patients who have perforation have certain high risk factors like young age, but totally different from the other risk factor we have seen. Young age, white race and profound weight loss. Do you think these factors, although they're from one paper only, could be used as a guide to surveillance endoscopy? And because these are the risk factors for a perforation or a complication of a marginal ulcer. Would any of the panelists want to take a guess on this or an you know, opinion on this? 
have anybody you know uh, do you agree with this uh, it's, it's, this is yeah. from data i would have to say sandeep uh, i'd like to see other papers validate that because if you're talking about young patients so what do you mean by that you know <laughs> Which young? I don't like Dr. Phobie, my age. <laughs> um, in white, you know, that's a high percentage of patients in the Western Hemisphere anyway. Uh, so I, I think it needs to be validated. Yeah. But if I can, I want to go back to Mal. You know, Mal, did I hear you correctly that there, you said there was 16% of patients with OAGB have a marginal ulcer on on surveillance, and it was seven okay. percent. Yes. Why is that correct? Because that's the highest I've seen. So I guess, maybe yes. Uh, yeah. I guess really big the question though is. But we did this on every patient. That okay, it's the first time I've seen that the OAGB has twice. The OAGB has twice the the marginal ulcer rate that a ruin Y. So that's new to me. But it also begs the question, uh, how important you know, is an asymptomatic ulcer? And I see in my own experience, you know, not all, but most that end up with a catastrophic problem like a bleed or perforation, if you talk to them carefully, they're usually symptomatic, in my experience, before they have the disaster. So uh, I think that's worth the discussion. Uh, can I say something on this? I think, again, one of the papers showed one in five uh, perforated marginal ulcer. What the perforation was the first presentation. Mm -hmm. So maybe, as you say, you take a detailed history, you may find some symptoms. But again, some of them are very vague. And uh, so marginal ulcer, asymptomatic marginal ulcer is a problem. Whether they need to be treated and, you know, whether they go on to perforation, we need to have more data. I think maybe when we're inching towards the end of the discussion, let's have one final comment from each of the panelists. Maybe we can start from the reverse. Dr. Omar, can you want to make a final comment? And I'll just make it. Yeah, I think I believe with all the studies that uh, were presented today, uh, including the study from your group, uh, Seth, and, and the data that Dr. Uh, Obi just mentioned, I think we need more uh, uh, publications to validate every single uh, uh, risk factor that is causing these ulcers and uh, to check further on the modifiable risk factors, again, from the patients and the technique itself. And uh, these are procedure specific sometimes. Uh, 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 the, the importance of the paper that you uh, mentioned or that you uh, published is that uh, it shows also that minigastric bypass, uh, as any other surgery we do, has complications. And uh, this is a fact. And we just need to be more cognizant about it. Uh, and, and we need to report it to see how we can get this, uh, this uh, problem or this pathology better. Right. Dr. Taha, about Thanks final about, uh, thoughts on this? Yeah, one last thing. Uh, um, the, Omar mentioned something about the effect of the vagus nerve when transected about the you know, uh, evacuation of the, re of the uh, re retained stomach. Actually, uh, Professor Mohid Benna of Egypt published a paper, I think, a few weeks back about uh, uh, vagus nerve preserving OAGB. And we've been doing actually some of those cases, but not didn't publish it yet. Uh, we yet to find uh, we yet to find the actual effect of that, but I think that's probably one way of eliminating one risk factor also. Uh, Dr. Uh, Reinwald, uh, we have final thoughts, uh, let's say on uh, surveillance endoscopy versus extended PPIs uh, or anything you want to say? Yeah, yes, uh, thanks. Um, actually, I, I got the message that I feel that we have to adapt our algorithms to our uh, patient populations and to our infrastructures. And and so it might be very, di very uh, different operating on, uh, on patients in India or in the United States. Uh, the compliance is different. The BMI is different. There are genetical factors, and and all this we must uh, so we must consider our personal local uh, experience. Of course, that's that's my feeling, and in general, I feel it's it's not a bad idea 
to have uh, some kind of endoscopic uh, follow-up to, or to try to have it at some time. If it's after one year or two years, perhaps it's not so important, but I feel we should try to motivate our patients having some uh, endoscopic control uh, at least uh, during the first five years after this kind of, of, uh, of operations. And also I feel reconfirmed with a kind of uh, post-operative prophylactic uh, PPI intake, whether it is three or six months or so, but perhaps not more. That's my, uh, right. my opinion. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. Thank you. Uh, sorry, Sonia, your thoughts, final thoughts? Um, yeah, conclusion. Take away for the audience. Yeah. Four things. Prevention, talk to the patient about um, the lung complication risks, um, so communication, um, and choose the right procedure, the right biotic procedure for every patient based on the risk and comorbidities. And uh, the fourth thing I have to say, um, endoscopic surveillance, I have to indicate only in high volume centers um, for uh, studies, yeah, publications to have data, not routine. That's very, that's very well said. Dr. Rutledge, uh, you're the originator of these operations. Uh, just two comments. Uh, number one, I think that uh, reviewing the recent data on H. pylori eradication in countries where the risk is high of gastric cancer related to H. pylori has been somewhat disappointing because of the induction of resistance. So I think it's worth looking at that topic for uh, the MGB purposes as well. And then, <clears throat> And uh, otherwise, I would uh, compliment the group on the discussion. Right. And Dr. Phil Shah, and then last and not the least, Dr. Forby. Yeah, no, I, I just want to thank the IBC for putting on, you know, this program. Uh, I do think, uh, you know, marginal ulcer, whether it's, uh, you know, from a um, one anastomosis bypass or ruin Y, uh, in my opinion, is the Achilles heel of this procedure. And, you know, since surgeons began well, since Dr. Mason, the late Dr. Mason began performing, you know, gastric bypass as a, as a loop bypass over 50 years ago in 1969, this has still been a problem. Perhaps we've reduced the rate slightly, uh, but still it's a problem. So I think it, it behooves all of us um, to keep this in mind as we prepare patients for surgery to modify their risk factors perform the operations with good uh, technique, um, paying attention to all the technique uh, to minimize uh, the ischemia using absorbable sutures. And then finally, you know, paying attention to good post-operative care, prophylaxis where it needs to be done, surveillance where it needs to be done to try to reduce this problem that has been ever present for 50 years. It's the Achilles heel of these procedures. Thank Thanks you. for the comments. And uh, finally, Dr. Forby. And maybe Dr. Ken Loy wants to make a quick comment after Dr. Uh, Forby. Go ahead, Ken. Dr. Forby. All right. No, I think Phil has wrapped it up completely and effectively. The truth is, marginal ulcers will occur after any bypass, one anastomosis, long limb, just for the nature of the operation and the fact that we're connecting the small bowel to the stomach. The question is, how significant is it? As I was talking to what study we do in terms of surveillance, even though the percentage was high in the marginal, in the OAGB group, but when we looked at those who presented with symptoms, they were both around 2.3 and one was 2.6%. So there's difference between what you find doing a routine test and what the patients come complaining with. So the point is that these things do occur, they are significant and we have to do whatever we can to minimize the occurrence. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Phoebe. Uh, Ken, you want to make a quick comment before I you know, yeah, summarize I the um, panelist's yeah. opinion? And in Australia, I think um, we had the privilege of treating multicultural patients. And I think we had a cohort of Middle East patients. We had a cohort of white Caucasian patients. We don't have the mandatory to screen everyone, but there's a lot of... Um, excuse to screen anyway if they have iron deficiency if they have history of abdominal pain if they are helicobacter um, i mean we do screening for colorectal cancer right i mean obviously 
all those are excuses to stick a camera up the throat and have a look to identify the problem. So it shouldn't be an issue, but we don't mandate it. But there's disproportionately high marginal ulcer rate in our Middle East cohort. And I think a lot of the time we ask them is they don't, they say they don't smoke, they usually don't drink, but they do occasional shisha, which apparently is a very high concentration of, um, of nicotine, which probably can be a problem. So I'm wondering whether if any of the panel have seen this sort of issues. Uh, anybody who wants to respond to Ken? I just come uh, from a country that smokes a lot of shisha and yes, it is more concentration for sure. And if you ask anyone who smokes shisha, which they do about six or seven um, uh, packs per day, they would tell you they don't smoke. They don't consider smoking, unfortunately. So uh, this, this in a country that has a lot of Middle Easterns, I guess, coming from uh, um, uh, Middle Eastern countries or the MENA region, I believe that's something that should be screened for as well. Well, thank you very much. I'll just wrap up. Uh, I think, uh, uh, yeah, so I think most of the panelists agree that it's a significant problem. And the house is obviously divided on the protocol for surveillance endoscopy with roughly 50% on each side. And uh, Dr. Rain was saying the logistics also dictate how we go about following these patients. Obviously, the logistics, the policy of the center in the insurance cover. Uh, uh, the communication is very important, as Dr. Uh, Sonia said, about patient being counseled about that there, it is a problem which can occur, especially in the first two years, and they need to take some sort of prophylaxis. The duration of prophylaxis varies, but most of us agree, from a three month to two years, and maybe five years if the data is available. And uh, I think the other risk factors like H. pylori, smoking, and NCID use have been discussed, and they are important to be modified. Uh, uh, so uh, I think uh, for surveillance endoscopy, I think we're keenly awaiting Dr. Phoebe's paper and maybe more data. And uh, so I think we definitely need more data before we can recommend a surveillance endoscopy. But high-risk group surveillance is, is, a, is a doable thing. And maybe there's a midway between our routine surveillance for all patients versus surveillance for high-risk patients. I thank all the panelists for their you know valuable time and comments and which made really this discussion very enriching. And I'm, I hope all of us benefited from this discussion. Thank you, Harris. Thank you, everyone. And uh, bye. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Sandeep. This was spectacular. And uh, before okay. I pass it on to Professor Mario Musella so he can give us some closing remarks, I want to say we have around uh, 5,000 plus live viewers. Uh, for this event. It was a spectacular event, and I have to tell you, Sandeep, you kept our panel of experts on their tiptoes today. Yeah, so I'll pass you. it on uh, to Mario Musella for some closing sure. remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ariel. Well, uh, I've heard uh, a very interesting presentation and a lot of interesting and authoritative comments, of course. Uh, well, I, I would like to stress just uh, what Sonia was, was, was about to comment with regards to the endoscopic surveillance of the OAGB or in general of, of a, a, any bariatric procedure. I believe that one issue is, is a study setting. I mean, a research institute in which we scope all our patients to detect any eventual ulcer. And according to the paper that Dr. Agarwal showed us at the beginning of the of the of this presentation, in my opinion, uh, currently it is not justified to make a, a regular surveillance for the one anastomosis gastric bypass. At the moment, is the, the results we have they do not justify. So one issue is the research, and other is the clinical practice. Of course, I, I, I agree with Dr. Schauer when he says that he's not justified, but I believe not only for the one anastomosis gastric bypass, for the simple reason that it is not only a cost benefit reason, but all, even because if I should ask to my patient that is in good health and is in good shape, is having good results with any bariatric procedure to undergo an AGDS, he probably would escape. So uh, I think we should take in account this, this uh, with regards to our patient in the clinical practice. So one issue is the study and other is the clinical practice. So this is my very humble opinion.
This has been an IBC Oxford University Hot Topics in Surgery production. I want to thank my co-chair, our moderators, and our distinguished panel of experts for their valuable time and talent today. We want to acknowledge all our partners and sponsors as our global collaboration produces safer and better outcomes. Register to obtain CME credits for this and upcoming events at cine-med.com forward slash IBC 2021. To view past Hot Topics in Surgery episodes, go to ibcclub.org or any of our social media platforms. Don't forget to mark your calendars as the third IBC Oxford University Congress has been rescheduled to September 19th through the 21th of 2022. For more information, go to ibccongress.org. And now let's view another brief episode of IBC's exclusive Spotlight on Industry and today's sponsor. From IBC Global, stay safe and God bless. My name is Gary Teagan. I'm the Senior Director for Clinical Affairs at ConMed's Advanced Surgical Division. So ConMed Corporation has been dedicated to smoke evacuation for some time, first with uh, its own line of smoke evacuation products for open surgery and laparoscopic surgery, uh, second with the acquisition of SurgiQuest, which brought to market uh, really best-in-class laparoscopic options for insufflation and smoke evacuation with the air seal system. ConMed purchased a company called Buffalo Filter, which was regarded as the leader in uh, smoke management. The Air Seal IFS, or Intelligent Flow System, works with three different modes of operation. The first mode is Air Seal mode, and that basically provides a constant pneumoperitoneum and continuous smoke evacuation. Uh, it also incorporates the use of the Air Seal access port, which is a valveless trocar. Uh, there's a group of super users, which we've given instructions to, uh, that enables them to use it in such a way that it minimizes the potential for gas venting out the top of the port. Uh, any gas that does go back to the IFS is filtered down to 0 0.01 microns using our proprietary filter, and that was validated independently by an outside organization. Um, the IFS also has a second mode called smoke evacuation mode, and this is our closed loop solution. By closed loop, I mean it, uh, there's an insufflation line and a smoke evacuation line. It can be used with two conventional trocars, standard trocars, as long as they have uh, lure lock connectors or stop docks. And this basically provides a continuous loop of insufflation and smoke evacuation. When the gas returns to the IFS, it is filtered through the same filter media, which filters down to 0.01 microns. The third mode that the IFS has is something called standard insufflation mode. And this basically functions like any other conventional insufflator. Uh, it provides carbon dioxide and then senses every few seconds to make sure that the pressure is appropriate. But we often recommend the use, uh, certainly in the COVID area, of an ancillary smoke evacuation system, something like the Plume Port Active, uh, which is made by Buffalo Filter, recently acquired by ConMed Corporation. And this product uh, connects to the canister on the ground and also contains a 0.1 micron filter. So, Gary, tell us about what the whole system is comprised of. So, you basically need the IFS. Uh, and then your choice of three different tube sets. Again, the ASM EVAC for air seal mode, this SEM EVAC for smoke evacuation mode, and what we call the SIM tub or standard, standard insufflation tubing. People buy the air seal system to use it in air seal mode. Uh, the COVID area has actually opened up another opportunity for us uh, with our second mode, uh, which is smoke evacuation mode. And that incorporates uh, a tube set that has two lines that split one goes to, um, they both go to the stopcocks of individual uh, trocars, conventional trocars. And one is an insufflation line and the other is a, is a smoke evacuation line. Can I understand then that also the micro droplets produced by the ultrasonic uh, devices, will those also be uh, removed? That's a great question. So in both air seal mode and smoke evacuation mode, uh, the air seal IFS is drawing gas from the cavity back to the box for filtration. And that basically, um, it filters any gas that comes back, whether it be uh, 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 smoke from electric cautery or some type of plume some, from an ultrasonic device uh, can be drawn back to the IFS for filtration. Uh, and then either um, departure out the back of the box in smoke evacuation mode or recirculation back to the, uh, the air seal access port if you're using it in air seal mode. How does one find the devices or contact the company for more information? 
So uh, ConMed is an international organization. Uh, we have primarily direct representation in most countries. We have distributor representation in some countries. Uh, you can certainly email me at garyteagan at conmed.com and I will forward uh, the contact information for the person requesting uh, information on our products. So this is Spotlight on Industry, Smoke Evacuation and Insufflation. We want to thank Gary Teagan from ConMed Corporation for joining us today. Thank you for having me.